Going, everybody. Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, and Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern. And it is Tuesday here on the show. And you know what that means? Well, I'm here on location from beautiful near Honolulu, Hawaii. But I will be here uh, the next several days doing Observer Live. We've got Brian and Vinny tonight. And Granny made out of the show, so we got a lot to talk about there. And uh, plenty to get into on today's program. Going to start off with the big story in wrestling, obviously, which is everything involving Vince McMahon. And we have a Chicago-based law firm which is looking to speak with potential victims and witnesses of abuse at WWE. This came out on Monday. We, of course, were not on the show due to President's Day. But we will tell you all about that today, who they are looking for, etc. And also, Paul Roma has come out, who, uh, of course, wrestled from WWE 87 and 91, and uh, talked to News Nation's Ashley Banfield regarding the allegations against Vince John Laurinaitis and WWE, and mentioned that he knows of wrestlers who left the company due to being asked for, quote, sexual favors. So we'll tell you what Paul Roma had to say. And then, of course, all of the other news from the weekend and the last couple of days, including Raw yesterday, the SmackDown show on Friday with The Rock joining the Bloodline. We've got NXT tonight. Booker T, not back yet, but should be back soon. Kevin Ash talks about not being allowed to attend Sting's final match. We got TNA updates, notes from the Raw show, and plenty more. If you want to text us here today, 425-780-7566 is the phone number. That is 425-780-7566, F4W online at gmail.com, as well, well as F4W online threads, Instagram, and Cameo. At Brian Alvarez on X. Back in a moment. Observer Live. You're clear. Hey. But here's the thing. Afterwards, we had this big momentous moment where you were confronted by none other than Nick Nemeth, who was making his TNA wrestling debut. I want to get your thoughts on uh, Nick Nemeth coming into the company. Oh, um, even though he took me out, which I'm going to get mine back when the time is right. Um, but let's leave that alone. Uh, but talk about Nick coming to the company. I think it's huge for TNA. Obviously, um, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he's a superstar. I mean, he he's he's done everything in professional wrestling. He's been a world champion. He's been a tag team guy. He's been a he's won every single title you can think about. He's had it. Um, he's been all over the world. Um, he has a he he um, he has a huge buzz going right now. And for him to pick TNA over AEW in New Japan or any other company he's working, that shows that TNA is a, is a hot spot right now, right? Um, so I'm happy he's part of the team. I'm happy I get to do something down the road with him. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that TNA is is starting to be a, a spot where people want to come to. Same thing with Ash by Elegance. Um, her picking us over other companies out there um i'm happy she's part of the team and um i can't wait to see what um the future brings with nick and ash and my last question to you is dream opponents you're the champ now man you know you're gonna have everybody coming after you who are some of the opponents that you're like let's go i need to get a match with this person oh man the first one that comes to mind is not he doesn't even it's not a full-time guy in our company but we kind of had a um, had a preview of the tapings in Vegas was Okada. Um, he's a, a guy I would like to have another one on one match with. It's been six years since I had a one on one match with him. I was a kid. Um, actually, it was longer than six years. It was I've been wrestling for ten, so it was nine years ago because I was a one year into wrestling when I had a singles match with Okada. So I was a kid. I was. I was a kid in wrestling, so I would like to have another one-on-one -on -one match now that I'm a adult in wrestling. 
and I would like to see how that plays out. The show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And hopefully this is all working out now. I don't know what happened in that first segment, but my audio was out of control. And uh, Those guns are out of control. Look at you. Oh, my God. Why are you so hot? I don't know. Okay. It's how God made me. Hey, can you can you speak normal so I can adjust all of this on the fly right now? How normally do you want me to speak? Do you want me to push okay, it like away that. a little further, like this? No, Is this I, okay. No, I want you. To, oh my God, can you can you speak like a normal person? What did you do this weekend? <laughs> I didn't miss you. I can tell you that right now. Okay, I, that that's how I'm testing if we're if we're if we're on the same wavelength here. You're you testing I mean? my patience, that's for sure, and probably the patience of the listeners as well. No, if you had heard the opening segment, that was testing the patience of the listeners, because even it Dom sounded, told me i got to fix this. It sounded good on the gimmick here. It did on the, uh, on the Twitch here. No, it sounded all right. It was outrageously, outrageously loud. Anyway, <laughs> we got a lot to get into here today, everybody, and uh, obviously the first story here involves everything involving Vince McMahon, which is too much. Chicago-based law firm looking to speak with potential victims and witnesses of abuse at WWE. Pintas and Mullins advises or advertises itself as one of the nation's leading law firms fighting sex abuse and has launched a website at WWEsettlements.com. Site states that, quote, if you were sexually assaulted, made to feel uncomfortable, or witnessed sexual abuse by Vince McMahon or anybody from WWE slash UFC, slash UFC, by the way, uh, you may be entitled to significant compensation. It says here that, of course, Vince and WWE slash UFC are under investigation for sexual assault and sex trafficking after former employees at WWE slash UFC came forward. I think that these, it should be TKO. By throwing UFC in here, I mean, it makes the whole thing read weird. But, uh, yeah, but you came know what they're doing with that wording. Well, yes. According to a recent lawsuit, the founder and other leaders forced employees to participate in sexual acts by threatening to terminate their employment and share intimate images of them. They mentioned Rita Charleston and the uh, 2022 document seizure from Vince McMahon. It said thousands of abuse victims are speaking up every year to receive the compensation and justice they deserve. They put over the firm A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and they note that along with Ben Crump Law, Pintus and Mullins also assisted the family of George Floyd following his wrongful death at the hands of Minnesota police officer Derek Chauvin. So obviously, you know, they're looking for people. What this means, I don't know in the sense that, you know, sometimes these uh, these law firms see something going on and they... They come out to uh, to see what they can do, if that makes sense. Well, look, uh, their whole thing is based on, if you look at their website, they'll get you that metho, mesothelioma money, and they deal with birth injuries and nursing home abuse and sexual abuse. I mean, that's kind of how they make their bones, and that can be good, you know, when you're trying to go up against a large corporation and you want to get people banding together to try to make a difference and to try to get their piece of the pie back. The problem in a lot of these cases, though, and we saw it with Constantine Kairos in the concussion lawsuit, and that plays into this not only because he's released information about what she had said in the affidavit, but about the the negative to that one big negative to that lawsuit is it has 
damaged some of the credibility of Massaro's claims because we have her reportedly from WWE side to the New York Post coming out and saying she's apologized for it and she didn't want to be a part of the lawsuit. She was poached to be a part of it, which a lot of times a lot of these lawsuits will do that. When you hear negatives about lawsuits like this, they've tried to cast a net to bring people in and ultimately the only ones who make any money and the only ones who get any satisfaction are the lawyers out of the deal and the kairos thing is going to be interesting because again he was a negative in the overall long run because he got sanctioned for bringing up a frivolous lawsuit when it came to this and and that's who was representing masaro so i'm sure wwe is going to bring that up um and i'm hoping that these lawyers pintas and and mullins are actually doing this for quote unquote the right reasons as opposed to just a monetary or hey look at us one and then we've also got this the uh the paul roma story paul roma says male wrestlers in wwe were propositioned by people within the company he spoke with news nation's ashley banfield news nation has been by the way all over this story and he this said right that uh well yeah they actually um well anyway he says it wasn't so much Vince as it was the people that he had surrounding him. You're talking about an industry where you have young, good-looking, well-built men in the ring. Half naked, three-quarters naked, actually. So, yeah, I mean, it left a door open. He had a lot of people around him, vice presidents and bookers that were very much into that. And they put you in a really, really bad situation, especially once you started making some money. You kind of get comfortable with that. And then you find out that your job is on the line. Either do it or get fired. And I witnessed quite a few that walked away. The money wasn't worth it for them to go that route, so to speak. When Rome was asked to clarify what the wrestlers were asked to do, he said, they were asked to do things, sexual things with other men that they did not want to do, my former partner being one of them. I was actually in a cab ride in Washington, and we were coming back, and the gentleman next to me kept saying, it's not worth it, it's not worth the Benjamins, it's not worth the Benjamins. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he says, it's not worth it. We got back to the hotel. The next day we were filming for our second TV taping, and he was gone. He jumped on a flight, went back home, and never showed up again to wrestle. And he had an unfortunate accident, hit his head, and passed away while he was asleep. He had a bleed on the brain. And he mentioned that uh, Jim Powers uh, dealt with similar issues. He said, my former partner, one of my former partners, when it was part of the Young Stallions, he was proposition. He said he went to one of the agents, told them what had happened, and I said, why would you do that? You just ratted on both of us. So he kind of threw us both under the bus, and we were just starting out. And then he was asked to clarify what the executives were propositioning. And he said, let's leave it this way. That's all it could be. If somebody is going to give you money, then it has to be that. There's nothing else. It's not going to be one of the other boys you're wrestling with. They're not going to offer you money. Even my former partner, same thing. They offered him money, drugs. Just lay on your back. They said, you don't have to do a thing. And he came running right to me when I came to TV. He said, dude, what are you going to do? I said, I've already spoke to Arnold. And I said, well, why did you do that? You just killed our team. What do you think they're going to do? He's just going to uh, go to the same people that propositioned you. So another one coming out, this yeah. time Paul Roma from things that happened in the uh, 80s and early 90s. And uh, that was his story on News Nation. You know, there's. I'm happy that News Nation is covering this because somebody needs to. But there is also another side to that. And, you know, Dan Abrams, who has got a lot to do with that station, the former News Nation, this is the former WGN America. It's owned by the same people that own the CW. And Banfield and Cuomo and these other shows that they have on there, I... You know, the Paul Roma was basically didn't really say anything on there and yes, brought up basically things about Patterson and the culture. But it, it unfortunately wasn't really framed in him going after the culture. It was him kind of with an axe to grind and then being weird about it, you know, being upset that Jim Powers came out. And complained and, and, you know, said, you know, you complained to Arnold. I mean, you, you buried our team. You killed our team. And it was, you know, and at the end, you know, where he talks about he was one of the guys that didn't comply. And if he, you know, I told him if that was me, I was going to kill somebody if they did that. You know, we're starting to, I, I worry in bringing some people on and bringing some of these old heads on to talk because I've heard some old heads and seen what some of them have said on their podcasts and they've embarrassed themselves 
and I have a concern that we're going to move away from a lot of the serious aspects of this for the step and fetch it carnival act. Hey, we need ratings and Hey, this is going to be Nancy Grace and Banfield's going to have a, I hope we don't get away from the seriousness of what all of this is, as opposed to just the salaciousness as we look for ratings. Back in a moment with more observer live. about the process of bringing her in and just how you felt about that uh listen more than anything i can identify with people coming out of another company and maybe feeling like they never got utilized to their fullest potential and you know that's how she felt and i didn't know ash before and of course we you know it's a small world the wrestling world whether you know people or not you feel like you know them you know of them you know people you know, there's always a connection. And so many people were telling me, you know, she wants to work. She wants to do something, you know, generally she could go say to AEW or something like that. And you just never know what's going to happen. At least I think we are known for at least pretty much when someone comes into our company, we're going to utilize them. Um, I think that's a known fact and people can just sit back and watch our product and see that. And also the knockouts division is also, hey, we averaged three female matches on a (laughs) pay-per-view. We pretty much use every single girl in that locker room. Um, That's enticing to talent, right? And they want to be used and they want to, and I've heard about her work ethic. She's really expressed and every other person that worked with her vouched for her work ethic. I respect that. You know, I, I like those people who are hungry and want it and want to add something to our division and i think she's going to be a great addition i think she's already made a splash and now let's see what she's got in the ring and everything else and i can't wait to see her new character and what she wants to bring to it she's excited um so i think the fans are gonna be pleasantly surprised right i just can never give her enough props because of not only the performer that she is but the human being that she is you know, she's never changed from the girl that I met in NXT. I worked with her. I think people forget when she first came into WWE because I was there on the main roster and she was, and of course, everyone coming into the company is going to be all timid and nice. She's never changed from that person. If anything, she's only gotten better. She is so, it's a testament when you see her interact with the fans and how much they love her and all her loyal fans and the love that she gives back. So I'm talking about outside the ring right now and to see her in the ring. Listen, we can already, we already know she's a star, right? And to see her level up in the ring, because obviously we have a great division. We give the girls a lot of time. We feature them a lot, main events. She has killed it. And I think it just opened up this confident, newfound confidence for her as well. And I, I remember her when she came into the company, I wasn't there actually, I was doing Amazing Race at the time for her debut, I missed that. <laughs> I had dealt, I had talked to her before. And then I saw, I mean, she had her first match with Kylan King, which was off the charts. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sever, VV, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And we got a bunch of shows coming up, including NXT tonight, AW Dynamite tomorrow, Elimination Chamber on Saturday. And in fact, the um, Elimination Chamber is the next live WWE show because they've already taped SmackDown and they've already taped NXT. And so uh, we're not going to give NXT spoilers. I know people can get very sensitive about their spoilers. But uh, tonight on the show, we got Lyra Valkyria against Shotzi for the women's title, which uh, this is actually a spoiler. Uh, Shotzi gets hurt in the match and is unable to continue. And so they do a a legitimate call-out. Who can come out here and face 
Lyra, because we need somebody right now, and uh, it ends up being accepted by, of all people, Lash Legend. So Lash is going to do a legitimate, impromptu championship match tonight on the show. With no practice, just call it in the ring. <laughs> so we're going to see how that goes. You know what? I tell you what, if they would have inserted Lola Vice or Jada Parker into that match and they then they didn't win, the, the people at NXT would have rioted. We would have been hearing about that place still burning after a week. So we got that. We got Oma Femi versus Lexus King. We got Josh Briggs versus Brooks Jensen. I love it. The Virgin versus the Fornicator. <laughs> For those of you following that story. Roxanne <laughs> Perez versus Ren Sinclair. And Ilya Dragunov and Carmelo go face-to-face. -face. You think the Virgin will get busted open? So we've got the Dynamite show coming up tomorrow. And uh, I got to talk about this. I got to talk about this one. You know what? When I adjust in the chair, I got to talk about something. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is what we have for the, the show thus far. We have John Moxley and Claudio versus Dax and Cash. We have got Joe, Swerve, and Brian Cage versus Hangman Page, Hook, and Rob Van Dam. Which, by the way, they've got... Um, Hangman Page on the babyface team, and they have got uh, Swerve on the heel team. And I know that when this was announced and this was brought up, people are like, don't you know what a Pareja's in Craveless match is? <laughs> that's, um, that's not what it's billed as. It's just billed as a six-man. So if you want to make up your own storyline, you're welcome to, but they did not bill it as that, okay? They just That's where everybody was put on these teams. And then we've got uh, Tony Storm in action. And we've got Deanna Parazzo in action. Okay? Why do I bring that up? I don't Why know. do I bring this up? Okay. Well, I bring it up because the show's coming up. Oh. But this is, this is the point that I want to make. Okay? This show is taking place from the Box Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay? Box Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let's check WrestleTix. I want to make sure I don't screw this up because people get mad. Oh, man, imagine if that okay. Virgin Fornicator match was happening in the box. All right. So the box center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they are at 2,700 tickets, okay? 2,700 tickets. This is the first time that they have ever run the box center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They have sold 2,700 tickets. Now, yes, this is better than when they were selling 1,800 tickets or 2,200 tickets or whatever, 2,700 tickets. But 2,700 tickets for the first show in Tulsa, Oklahoma, this is not lighting the world on fire, okay? Now, I have a point to all of this because I know people are like, they're getting ready to start furiously typing. CMLL and BCC at Arena Mexico. You know that match coming up? Yeah. Okay. Completely sold out. All right? It's awesome. New Japan, the Moxley-Naito championship match, which is coming up. They are opening up more seats now. Uh, that show is uh, now opened up to 6,800. I think they originally, what they opened it up for originally, like three or four. Something like that. And, uh, and all of the tickets have been selling, and so they keep opening up more and more seats. We're now at almost 7,000. For that show, and it's still quite a ways away. AW Revolution has the Sting and Darby championship match against the Young Bucks, the final match of Sting, okay? That's at uh, over 13,000, I believe, okay? So we've got BCC, CMLL, Arena Mexico sold out. We've got New Japan, Moxley, Naito for the title, 6,800. They're adding tickets. We have got Revolution, Sting and Darby versus the Bucks, 13,000. And we've got Dynamite in Tulsa at 2,700. Okay? I think it is so patently obvious what's going on here. And the other thing that I should mention, by the way, is that um, uh, WWE did a house show this weekend, which Dave noted. Uh, did like 7,000 fans or something. They, they did well in both Oakland and Fresno on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Like 7,000 fans for a house show. 
Okay? Not a Raw. Not a SmackDown. A house show. Not even a house show with CM Punk wrestling Dominic Mysterio or whatever. It's a random house show. Okay? So, here's the point. I think. I've been wrong before. I think we can all agree, except for Lenny, that WWE is hot right now. Correct? They're I hot. I think so, yes. Okay. I think we can all agree. I'll, I'll say this so people don't get mad. AW is cooled off. I they're won't cold, say Brian. they're cold. I will. I'll say they... Hey, the pay-per-view's got 13,000. The pay-per-view's well, got 13,000, so I can't say they're cold. That's they, true. But they have cooled that's off, true. okay? Yeah. They have cooled well, off. All right? They don't now, draw well. How about that? Well, here's the thing. The pay-per-view is drawing well, okay? What do the pay-per-view, CMLL at Arena Mexico, and the New Japan show with Moxley and Naito all have in common? That is not John Moxley. What do they all have in common? Big fight feel? Big fight? Big big shows? I mean, what? I they don't... announced the matches a long Made time ago, yeah. okay? Yeah. We knew the Moxley-Naito match, what, a month and a half, two months before the show? We knew Sting and Darby and Sting's final match months before the show. Yeah, but that uh, Sting's final match was going to carry that ball. Doesn't matter. The point is we knew the match months before the show. But, yeah. The Arena Mexico, the CMLL-BCC, we know that match month before the show. Okay? Well, here we are the day before Dynamite in Tulsa, and we know two matches. We know You're two right. matches. You're right. You're and right. and we know we know two people will be in action. That's it. We don't even know who Tony Storm's going to wrestle. We don't know who Deanna's going to wrestle. The the fact of the matter is, and here's why I brought up WWE, okay? When you are hot, you advertise a Raw show coming to town, you advertise a SmackDown show coming to town TV, and they sell out, okay? When you are particularly hot, you do a house show and you do seven, 8,000 fans, okay? Great. Just announced you're coming to town. You're going to sell tickets, okay? When you have cooled off, Dynamite Rampage coming to town is not enough, okay? Announcing a big match a week in advance is not enough, okay? You need to have big matches with big stars, big names, all of this announced far in advance to get people to go to the show if they're in town, travel to the show if they're nearby, okay? Obviously, with the revolution, you got to fly in. But the, the reason I also bring up New Japan is that New Japan Battle in the Valley show, they did not announce a card far in advance. They announced a card a week in advance. And as soon as they announced that card, because New Japan is cooled off, they're not hot like WWE. When they announced the crowd and they told you you're actually going to see Okada versus Tanahashi, seven days before the show, they started moving tickets. A lot of tickets. Because people knew the matches, okay? So Dynamite needs a full card a week in advance. A full card, okay? They've done the deal where, okay, well, you know, we're going to give you one big match two weeks from now. That's cool. We need more, okay? I think that I look at all these numbers. I look at what's selling, what's not selling. And the answer is what's selling is either what's hot or what they've told people about over a month in advance. What is not selling tickets is Dynamite Rampage, collision we're coming to town and a week before the show we're going to give you some matches and then tony's going to tweet out some matches two days before that's not working it's just not and i don't want people arguing about it because we've got plenty of evidence here it's not working <laughs> they're still going to try to argue with you anyway boss but yeah well, i'm not I agree. listening you're you're right um i will also say though if you have feuds that are hot if you have things that are hot you can get away with advertising two matches if there's other things if people know that other people are going to be there and there's hot stuff going on so like if the show yeah look if the show was hotter it would be better my thing with this is all of those buildings that you named including wind trust are all scaled properly to the events that they're running. WWE can run out, run anything and sell it out right now or come close to it in, in some cases, you know, especially when it comes to their PLEs. New Japan went running Wind Trust, that's 10,000 people. The Box Center is another example 
of why are you running this building in Tulsa when there are other buildings in and around there that are smaller than 20,000? Because unless they are planning and they're not because it's not on a college campus. I mean, this is where I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, to me, why are you running this building? Unless it's an incredibly amazing sweetheart deal, this is another example of you're putting 4,000 people in a 20,000 seat building. It's insane. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. How did you feel about your performance in the Rumble? Um, it went it went really well. Like all the girls were, they made me look incredible. Um, and thank God for that because like. They're there. They're, that's they're there, and they could the WWE fans can see them every week if they wanted to. But that was I only have one chance. Like I felt like my career was riding on that. <laughs> like that's that's just how it felt. And uh, for all the girls to just make me look as as good as they made me look, it was it was incredible. That moment with Naomi, a former Knockouts champion. You guys hug. And then you guys start like just like going at it. What was that even like? Like was it deja vu? I don't know. She well, first of all, the reaction we got was so cool. Um, I thought I didn't I didn't expect like all the people to kind of know our history. So the fact that when we were standing off initially, they had that reaction. We hugged. They had a reaction. And then when we started fighting, they had a reaction. It was just, it was so perfect. It was chef's kiss. Um, that was so freaking cool. And the fact that we wrestled, what, two weeks ago in front of a sold-out crowd for TNA, their comeback show, like, for the Knockouts World title, everything was just so perfect. Yeah, she is an incredible athlete and an incredible wrestler, and I never thought I'd be in the ring with her, at taking her finish, period. So the fact that that happened was actually crazy um what's funny was when we when everything we were playing the match whatever um and i said have you ever done you know your finisher on the apron and she said no she hadn't we we went over it in a practice ring it wasn't working and we didn't have a chance to go out we know that the, the ring aprons are bigger outside uh but we didn't have a chance to go out and like feel it out and one of the producers was like you don't have to have to do it if y'all didn't go over it and I just told her, like, do it. And if there's not enough room, just throw me on the ground. Like, just do it from the apron to the ground. And thank God that didn't happen. But <laughs> I, was tell I was telling the producer, like, I would do this in front of 500 people, much less 50,000 people. So I didn't have a problem with it at all. And uh, she's an amazing wrestler. And I feel like she would have protected me regardless of if we had to do it to the floor or not. <laughs> Yes, I was like, when I was watching it, I was nervous because I'm like, first of all, like you're taking this brutal bump. But then on top of that, Bianca, we know was supposed to be standing tall. And I was like, oh my God, what if she like loses her balance? What if she falls oh. too? Like, I was thinking like all of these things, but you guys went, I mean, you guys are pros, man. She's so good. No, no chance of that. She would have been fine. No, she would have no. just, she would have fallen off the apron and landed on my body. And like... <laughs> <laughs> Happen. You knew it would happen. What happened? You knew there would be somebody. Uh oh. Yes. Booble. Oh, my no. dear Booble. Oh, no. My dear Booble. <laughs> How are they supposed to announce matches when the storylines might not have happened on television yet? Now, I could oh. go nutty here, but I'm not going to. Let me, let me just help because maybe Booble really doesn't get it. Maybe some of you don't as well. Okay. Oh, what happened to pro wrestling? I didn't say. Well, first off, let me just say this. I love AEW. I want them to succeed. We all know I that. Would, I, I would like them to do, uh, you know, 8,000 people at a house show. I'd like them to do 13,000 people at all their television tapings, okay? And you know what's not going to help is saying that everything is all right as, as they do 2,700 in Tulsa, okay? That's not what's going to help. What is going to help is an idea. And you don't seem to understand, my friend Booble. 
I didn't say to announce a full card two months in advance, okay? Why don't we just go to the other extreme, all right? We got tomorrow's show. All right. Is is Brian Danielson on the show tomorrow? Is Brian Danielson on the show tomorrow? I don't, I don't Are the know. Young Bucks on the show tomorrow? I is Sting on the show so, tomorrow? I, I, not is Darby no. Allen on the show tomorrow? I, 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 no. I... Is uh, is uh, Saray on the show tomorrow? Uh, we know Britt Thunder Baker's Rosa, on the show no. tomorrow. No I Brett. mean, the, 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 the point is, we don't know. Bro, I have two matches here, okay? I have two matches, and I have two people in action. I don't know anything else, brother. I don't know who's going to be there. I don't know who's not going to be there, okay? Yeah, if you can give me a full card a week in advance, which is not two months, but a week in advance. Bro, hey, you know what? Let's look at the uh, the Raw show for next week. Raw show for next week, I got uh, Kofi Kingston and Xavier versus Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci. Sami Zayn versus Shin. I know two matches already for Raw next week. And, and that's they're coming hot. after a pay-per-view. Okay? Exactly. It's coming after a pay-per-view. Last week, the Raw lineup, we had like five matches announced for the next week's show. Okay? And that's a hot promotion. All right? This is a not-as-hot promotion. Okay? I got two matches, and I got no names. I have no names. I don't know who's going to be on the show. So, at the very least, how about you say, hey, uh, you know what? We have Revolution coming up, right? You're yeah. telling me this Tony Khan hasn't booked out the go-home show for okay, Revolution? Okay, time out. Stop right there. Stop right there. Because this is one of those things that I knew you were going to bring it up because I was going to bring it up. Everybody always talks about Tony Khan and his long-term ideas that he has, and he then thinks will happen, but he wants to stick to that long-term idea. You always bring that up. But there is a difference between having those long-term ideas and sticking to that mindset while maybe not being a really great day-to-day booker and week-to-week booker, which he doesn't seem to be because a lot of it is big matches and callbacks from the past in matches that uh, there's a lot of one Brian, he wouldn't have to advertise so much if people had a real idea of what feuds were going on and all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, but he if doesn't you know those, do a good job of that. But and we talked about my point. his long-term plan. Yeah. If he knows what's going on at the pay-per-view, then he should be able to list the names that are no going kidding. to be on the show. Exactly. I don't care about the matches, but, but you should but, know. Hey, listen, WWE, you don't think if WWE's going to run a show in Seattle in two months, I'm going to have a list of people that are going to be on the show? I am. Yes. Okay? They're going to give me a list of people who are going to be on that show. That's not that hard to do. Are they going to have the full card at that point for that show? No, they're not. But... A week in advance, you should have most of the card. You don't think Tony had the card for this week's Dynamite a week ago? Well, that's the thing. I'll is, bet you, you he know, did. But that's the thing is, Brian, and I bet you he probably did, but did it ever, did he ever get it off the sheet and out of the book to someone? To And that's the problem, is there is some sort of either, either he's not doing that, or there's a problem in a breakdown in how the communication is to get that to people. You know, one of the things that they did, I, I don't know, I, that, it just it, it drives me nuts how he goes about some of his, his matches. And this doesn't have anything really to do with it, but maybe a little bit in how he announces matches. A couple of weeks ago, and I can't remember what the match was at the end of, it may have been the House of Black and FTR at the end of Collision. They start throwing a bunch of matches up at the bottom of the screen about as the match is getting towards the end and then they start to, for next week and that's good in that wow okay we're, we got a, like a whole card for next week already and things that are coming up for the rest of the week on rampage on dynamite cool and then when the last 30 seconds of the show as they're fading out when there shouldn't be any talk and we should be seeing like it, letting everything sink in what happened in the ring, they bring those graphics back up again. And the announcers are now talking over what you should be seeing with the baby face in peril in the ring and laid out in, and, and grasping and, and breathe, you know, desperate for air, being desperate for air and the heels, you know, sneaking their way up the ramp and being, and, but instead the announcers are just like, 
there is an issue. There's a big issue, again, with how they go about a lot of how they do things. And it doesn't have to be like WWE, but it needs to be made a lot more clear. And it needs to somehow, again, get off of his booking sheet and get out of his notebook and to the people that need to promote it, because this is ridiculous. You're exactly right. Why do we not have at least a handful of names, if not a handful of matches for this week's show? It's crazy. People are bringing up the the brand split, and Lenny says the, bland, the brand split is stupid. Uh, anybody can appear wherever. Lenny, listen. I agree. I don't. I think the brand split is is unnecessary. Okay, but the person's point about the brand split was because of the brand split. When I buy my ticket, I know who's going to be on SmackDown. I know who's going to be on Raw. The if if somebody goes from Raw to SmackDown, that's a bonus. Okay, but you're going to get the SmackDown crew on SmackDown, and you're going to get the Raw crew on Raw, and they're going to tell you a month in advance these are the people that you are going to see on the show. And you know what? If they announce somebody on that show, and then the day comes and they don't uh, have a spot for them on the show, you're going to see them in a backstage segment. You are going to see them in a post-show match. You are going to see the people that they have advertised there. And you could do the same thing with AEW. You can tell me who is going to be there on the show, and you can find a place for them. If the problem is you have too many people, that's a different problem. But, like, finding a way to explain how everything is fine and they don't need really to change anything... Well, we do need to change some things because right now we need to be selling more tickets. What they're doing is fine in terms of television ratings. You know, they're they're not doing the famed million, but I mean, they're doing well in terms of Dynamite on Wednesday and, and Collision on, on Saturday. But they are not doing well in terms of selling tickets to the events outside of pay-per-views. And right. so whatever whatever you think is great, it's great for television. It is not working out great for live events. Well, and what were we talking about a couple of months ago when we were talking about getting in the local market and drumming things up and getting people onto affiliates that you may be that you may know and, and plugging in where people may know somebody in a, in an area and trying to utilize talent to do. We talked about that. A lot of people talked about that. And what did they start doing? They started doing more of that and taking care of that. So. For us to sit here, it's not like we're just bitching to bitch or something like that or complaining to complain. You know, again, there are simple things that for whatever reason are, again, as a fan, as a consumer, you know, I'm telling you, you know, we're telling you that things need to change. and Because, again, we're part of that group as much as we are on the other side as well, too. And we hear from people who have those issues and have those concerns. All right, uh, a couple of notes from Raw leading to the show this weekend and WrestleMania. Probably the biggest story in the show is Cody Rhodes did his first job in a year uh, and only his second job since coming back to WWE. He's only been beaten twice. I won't bring up the 24-7 title predictions that we had people on the chat. Uh, anyway. But anyway, he uh, lost for the second time. He lost to uh, Drew McIntyre. And this was after a distraction from Jimmy Uso and Solo. And so I think it's quite obvious what's going on here. And that is that Drew, if he has not actually re-signed, he has verbally agreed to re-sign. Solo is going to thumb Cody at WrestleMania for a very hot near fall in the Roman Reigns match. And then after Cody wins the title, it looks like it's going to be Cody versus Drew McIntyre. Which brings up the obvious question, what's going on with Drew McIntyre at the Chamber and WrestleMania? And I bring that up because I figured Drew was going to win and face Seth Rollins for the title, which you could do. But um, is he going to win and then you're going to do champion versus champion with him and Cody? Is he going to lose to Seth but then still challenge Cody? It doesn't make sense to lose to Seth if he's going to challenge Cody for the title. Or um, is he not going to win the chamber? And then who would win the chamber and face uh, Seth Rollins? I thought there was a possibility that they were going to do Drew McIntyre versus Sammy at WrestleMania. But after watching this show, I actually think that Sammy Zayn may end up facing Gunther and beating him for the Intercontinental title for his big WrestleMania singles win moment. 
So I don't know where they're going exactly, but I think that the bottom line is there ain't no way Drew's going to AEW if they just let him beat Cody Rhodes. I think they've got a verbal agreement or he has resigned. I hope for one night he brings back the old broken dreams music that he used to have back in the day. He truly is the chosen one now. At least he, I tell you what, I bet you he feels like the chosen one. He seems like it when he's out there cutting those promos, he seems happier than, you know, a pig and you know what. He's having a blast. I think he's incredible in what he's doing. And I still don't leave out the possibility just because it adds to him kvetching and complaining that he wins the chamber, maybe even beats Seth, but you know what? Doesn't even beat Seth. He hits the the kick on Seth, and then all of a sudden Damian Priest comes in there, lays him out, and steals that title off of him. And maybe we don't get Cody and Drew right away because we're going to get a little Damian and, 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 you know, Drew. You know, there's still a possibility there. There's still, to me... He would still be as Damian Priest, because at some point I think he's turning babyface, and Drew's such a great heel. Him leading the Judgment Day faction, you know, again, because again, I don't know how long Rhea Ripley is for it before you have to actually turn her babyface officially, but I don't know. I, I, I feel as though Drew McIntyre is signed from the way they're using him, and I'm happy about it because he's been great. So then after Cody gets beaten... They're backstage, and Adam Pierce is checking on him, like, how you doing? And Cody says, I- I'm fine. I'll be fine. And who should walk up but Seth Rollins? And he didn't say anything, but he looked at him, and he patted him on the leg, and he walked off. And what he said without saying it is, I told you that you needed a friend. You needed somebody to have your back. And so it has not been announced yet. But I think that Cody and Seth versus The Rock and Roman Reigns Ugh. has to be 95% at this Those point. Those two nerds are going to sing the Golden Girls theme song together, aren't they? I'm also trying to figure out this Rock booking, dude. Well, I'm trying to figure this one out. Dwayne. Let me tell you something. Mm. This Rock is a heel on SmackDown. Oh, my God. Did you see this segment? You had oh, to my, 1997 Rock, yeah. It was, but you know what? Roman Reigns comes out, and he's got his Levels Above shirt. And he gets in the ring, and listen, I'm a big fan of Roman Reigns. I think he's great. I think he's a great promo. I think, you know, whatever. But my God, The Rock was levels, levels above everybody in that ring. He was unbelievable. But I think that uh, there's a story here. Back in a moment, Observer Live. What made you make that leap, though, from from gymnastics to pro wrestling? Like, what happened there? Yeah, so my story is a little different. So I was finishing up my fifth year at Michigan State in gymnastics, and I got a message on Instagram from the WWE recruit page um, asking me, hey, would you like to come to a tryout at SummerSlam? This was the Nashville one, so in 22. And at first, I'm like, is this real? Like, there's no way that WWE is contacting me. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. So I went down to Nashville, I did the tryout. And thankfully, I was blessed with the opportunity for Triple H himself to offer me to come to the Performance Center and start training. And that's how I got into pro wrestling. I never would have thought in a million years that I would be a WWE superstar. So being here is so surreal. How has that training been like for you from going from gymnast to pro wrestling? Yeah, so I will say it's very very different it's foreign to me but then again the physicality of it is helps me a lot because i'm able to catch into the small details easier i would say just because in gymnastics everything is based on perfection so i have to make sure i know all the details i have to make sure the margin of error is very small so i believe that helps me in the ring with like body control details just making sure i'm aware um, i have air awareness so I believe gymnastics has helped me, but then again, it's still different because I'm not used to having someone hit me or being in the ring with someone else in gymnastics. It's just me by myself. What was first day of training like for you? Oh yeah, first day of training. So learning how to just control your body with like safety, like rolling and stuff, that was the easy part, but hitting the ropes the first time was so painful and just learning how to bump and stuff. That was probably the most painful 
being the most difficult thing ever. Yeah, and the easiest, like you said before, was just having body control. And I will say, like, coming from an intense sports background and into pro wrestling, being mentally tough is something that I was instilled in me when I was younger. And that's been able to translate because you have to be mentally strong in this industry. Who have you studied? Oh, yes, absolutely. So starting with in-ring wise, I would say RVD is someone whose style I absolutely love. I love also how authentic he is, how unapologetically himself he is. And that's something that I want to strive to be. I want people to be able to relate to me. And then also Bianca Belair is someone because she's so elegant, but she's also so powerful. And even she has this sass to her where she doesn't let anyone walk over her. So those are people who I studied. And then for promo wise, I love hearing Daniel Bryan cut his promos. He's very energetic. And it's cool to see even his evolution of how he started promos to where he was um, doing promos. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So tonight, I will be back for the Brian and Vinny show. And uh, Granny is going to be on the show tonight. I said last week she wasn't going to be on the show, but then I realized that Vinny is actually going to be at my house. So him and Sean can use those channels, and then Craig and Granny and I can be on remote channels. And so it is Black History Month, and so tonight... It will be Survivor Series 1998, which was The Rock winning the WWE title. First half-black uh, wrestler in WWE history to ever win the title. And you can watch all of the Rock Mankind. I think I think it's all the Rock matches what we're going to watch. But uh, you can watch all of Rock's tournament matches, and I believe it is uh, 50 minutes. Because uh, two of the matches go less than one minute. So uh, I think we're actually watching the, the uh, Rock and Mankind matches. All of the Rock matches, all of the Mankind matches, 50 minutes total for both of their full <laughs> tournament matches. So anyway, that's tonight. And, uh, and then I'll be back tomorrow with Dave, Wrestling Observer Radio. We were up last night as well, and uh, we had a lot to talk about there. And I don't know what else to say. Hey, I got else, something Mike? to say. I do What's have something that? to say. You What's see right that? here by me? You, since you're there right now, if you see any good, you know, Hawaii Rainbow Warrior stuff from, you know, the old throwback stuff with the rainbow on it, I suggest that you get me some of that as well as some Mauna Loa macadamia nuts directly. Oh, those are good. For, uh, exactly. And they're, they're wonderful. Yeah. Please. All right. Well, I'll think about it. And don't forget NXT. We'll review that tomorrow here on this program as well. That Lash Legend match. We're out of time, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.